This story comes from Erica, who shared with me a paranormal experience she had in 1997 when she was 15 years old. It was at her home, which was in a small town on top of a mountain in Virginia. I call it the sleepover. Two girls slowly make their way down the dark stairs. Stop pushing, Erica complains to Don, who is huddled behind her. Why are the lights out, Don asks. Erica answered, for the last time, I don't know. It's not like we don't have any light, holding up her iPhone. They carefully made their way down before stopping on the last step, staring at the front door. I don't hear any more, Don whispers. Erica holds her hand up. Shh, listen. Both girls stand perfectly still, waiting. After a couple minutes of only tense silence, Erica said in a nervous laugh, See? <laughs> it was nothing. Shaking Dawn off of her, she headed for the front door, checking to make sure it was locked. What about the lights? Dawn asked again. Normally not afraid of the dark, Dawn felt the hairs on her arms stand straight up. There was just something not right in the air. She could feel it. Erica tried to relax Dawn. It can't be for long. Mom said she was going to call and report the problem. Let's go back up to my room. We can wait for the lights to come on in there. She turns to go back upstairs when they hear a high-pitched cry, almost sounding like a kitten in distress, coming from the other side of the front door. Eyes wide, Dawn points to the door. There it is again. I know, I'm not deaf, Here's Erica hisses back. Dawn sneaks over and clutches Erica's arm. I don't like the sound of that sound. Erica sighed her impatience. There's nothing to be afraid of. It sounds like a cat. Please don't, Dawn pleaded. Listen to it. Something's not right. Seeing Dawn was really scared, Erica got on her knees in front of the door, pressing her ear to it, listening. The eerie cry made her jump, causing her to lose balance and fall on her butt. Dawn was right. There was something strange about it. Maybe it's hurt, she said. Please, can we just go back to your room, Dawn begged. Erica leaned her head close to the door and said in a low, comforting voice, Kitty, kitty? The answering call was louder, sounding more excited, and mixed in was a low growl. The sound sent shivers down Erica's spine. I'm with you, she said, getting up. Whatever it was, hurt or not, had to wait until the lights came back on. Dawn pulled Erica back onto the stairs. Come on, she whispered. It was Erica's turn to push Dawn on. The cry was scary now. The more they climbed, the louder the cry. When they reached the top, something started scratching on the front door. Both girls screamed as they went running into Erica's room. As they reached the bed, a loud crash with glass breaking was heard from downstairs. Shocked, they just stared at each other for a moment. Help me, Erica screamed as she grabbed one side of her dresser to push against the door. There was no lock. Grab the other side. A crying Don grabbed the other end and between the both managed to half drag, half carry the dresser against the door. Erica calls 911. Between her sobs, she tries to explain there is something breaking into her home. Terrified, she screams her address into the phone as the cry was heard downstairs. It was inside the house. 911 tries to calm her, telling her to stay on the line. A patrol car was only minutes away. Erica hears Dawn on the phone with her dad, hysterical as she keeps repeating there is a monster after them and he needs to come save her. The high-pitched cry got louder as it came closer. Erica was sure Dawn's scream could be heard across town. The 911 operator yells in Erica's ear to get her attention. Any other place to hide, he asks. She looks around frantically and sees the bathroom door. Dawn, get up. Get into the bathroom now. Dawn cringes behind a pillow on the bed, too afraid to move, crying for her dad to help them. Erica gripped her arm and jerked her off the bed bathroom now and pushes her in that direction. Dawn stumbles her way into the bathroom with Erica right behind her. 
Erica locks the door and starts looking for anything to protect them. Her phone shines on candles sitting on the edge of the bathtub. Blessing her mom for the scented candle, she forages through the top drawer knowing that was where the lighter was kept. Finding it, she opens the cupboard that holds her hairspray and grabbed all three cans. Testing the lighter to make sure it works, Erica has Dawn get into the bathtub to sit with her, each holding a can, and she tells her, if it breaks through, hold down and don't let go. Once I light it, it will work like a miniature fire torch. Let it come near us with these. When the cry sounded from the bedroom, it pumped terror through the girl's blood. It's in my bedroom, Erica whispered to 911. Where are the police? Why aren't they here? Her fear level was beyond beyond. She never felt so alone. Something was coming for them. She could feel its evil. It's outside the door. It's outside the door. Oh, please, please help us. Oh, please. She stammers into the phone. She lifts her arm, holding a can spray in front of her. Be ready, Dawn. If it comes through the door, start spraying. Dawn cries louder. Erica nudges her. Dawn, please, you have got to help me. Dawn gets her arm shakily into position. Erica about sprayed when the scratching started on the bathroom door. It was almost as bad as the cries. She screamed into the phone. You have to help us. It's trying to get in. We hear it. The 911 operator yelled to be heard above the screaming. Erica, the police are now on your street. They are almost at your house. Do you hear me? The police are outside. The overwhelming relief Erica felt was almost too much. Hurry, hurry, we're upstairs. This is my bedroom. Feeling brave for the first time, Erica stood up and yelled at the door. The police are here. At that moment, a siren could be heard in the distance. Do you hear that? They're coming to get you. The scratching got worse, the pitch of the cry higher. Go away! Leave us alone! She screamed at it with all her fear and frustration from the night. She looked over at Dawn, who had covered her ears with her hands to drawn out the cries from whatever it was. It seemed like forever before finally the siren sounded like it was right outside the house. The scratching abruptly stopped, and then a menacing cry that made Erica's skin crawl seemed to vibrate through the whole house. The girls hung to each other, cringing in fear. Moments later, Erica heard her name called. In here, we're in here, she called back. A knocking on the door by the police saying it was all right to come out. Erica slowly opened the door to see an officer holding a flashlight in her direction. She and Don flew into his arms, almost knocking him over, clinging to him, not wanting to ever let go. They were safe at last. Don's dad arrived and took them both home with him. Try as they might, they could not describe what it was, only what it sounded like. It seemed their story wasn't real until the police investigated the house. The final report stated the front door had deep claw scratches and one of the living room windows had been smashed in from the outside. There were claw marks on the ba bedroom door as well as the bathroom door. To the police, the girls had been attacked by a rabid bear perhaps. Hair samples and other evidence had been collected by a lab reported the samples were contaminated, so unable to match it to a bear 100%. Erica no longer stays in her home alone after dark, and the woods seem sinister now. She no longer uses it for shortcuts and will never camp again. Dawn, she does not come over to Erica's house anymore. They don't talk about it, just pretend it never happened. But there are rumors of others who have seen things outside their homes at night that cannot be explained. They all agree there is something hiding in the woods. This story is based on a real case from San Francisco, California. The call was answered at 2.37 a.m. 911, a scared sounding, sobbing woman in a raspy voice barely above a whisper begged, Help, he's here looking for me. Please help me now. We will send help, but I need your address, the operator asked. The woman gave it to her and hung up. 911 operations tried calling back, but got a recording stating the call could not be completed. A patrol car was sent to the location. The police parked on the street only to find an abandoned house on the verge of collapse. 
no electricity and no one inside. After checking with a neighbor, learned the house had been empty for years. They left convinced it was a prank. The next night at 2 a.m., 911 received another phone call from the same woman. She was frantically begging for help again. Kept stating he was looking for her and just like the other night, she hung up. Dispatch sent another patrol car to the address, but they could not find anyone in the house nor in the yard. The next five nights, 911 received two more phone calls from the same woman. The police had had enough and decided to find the pranksters. They tracked a number with the phone company and found out it did once belong to the actress but had been turned off years ago. The number had never been recycled. It deepened the mystery of who was making the phone calls and how. The police contacted the owner, an elderly man who lived outside of town. He knew nothing about any 911 calls coming from his place, obviously angry about anyone being there. The police decided staking out the house was the next step. That night, at 3 a.m., an officer watched as a car pulled into the driveway. Calling in the license plate learned it did belong to the homeowner. A few minutes later, 911 operations called, informing him a call had just been received from that address. The officer waited, and an hour later, the owner left. The next week, the police watched as the owner came back three times, sometimes with tools like hammers, shovels, and crowbars always between 2 a.m. and 3.30 a.m. What was he doing in a house so late at night with no light? The investigation showed the calls came whenever he was at the house. One night after he arrived, two officers decided to take a look around the place. Hearing bangs and grunts coming from the inside, they knocked on the back door. No answer. The banging and grunts continued. Fearing the homeowner may be hurt, they came in through the unlocked door. Following the noises, they found him tearing down a section of wall in what was once a dining room. Catching him totally by surprise, the owner was shocked, holding a hammer in midair. Is everything all right, sir? One of the officers asked. The owner got irate, insisting they leave at once. As they asked him questions as to why he was here in the dark remodeling, the more irate he got. One of the officers shined his flashlight toward the wall that had been torn open, and on closer inspection, saw what looked like a woman's skeletal remains. A phone card was wrapped around her neck with a rotary phone dangling against her chest. They arrested him on the spot. Medical examiner said she had been strangled and tests showed it was a homeowner's owner's wife who had disappeared 35 years earlier, a cold case. He was charged with her murder. During his interview, the police learned because he was selling the house, he needed to move the body and explain why he was there so late at night. Did the police involved in the case believe a ghost was making in 911 calls? His wife somehow calling for help? Let's just say that information was not put in the, in the file. They encounter more paranormal cases than most people know. This case is based on an investigation from 1995 I did in Lynchburg, Virginia. It was a case of two young brothers sharing a bedroom who were being terrified by something. Whatever it was, it sent them screaming from the room in the middle of the night, freaking the parents. It was starting to become a weekly thing, so I was requested to come out and do an investigation. Because of their age, interviewing them brought very little results, only that they were scared of the spider webs. The spider webs? I had scoped out the house and property earlier, but did not see or feel any energy signatures from ghosts. Yet these children's fear was real. Something was scaring them. The only way to learn what is going on is to stay the night in the boys' room. It's boring and exhausting, staying up waiting for something to happen. It was several nights before the music woke me, a lone piano playing a sad tune. 1.16 a.m. the clock ran. I walked around in room yet couldn't find the source. It was weird. The music stayed the same volume no matter where I stood. Stepping into the hallway, it stopped. But when I stepped back in the room, the music was heard again. Okay. And in the blink of an eye, there were bright white spider webs everywhere. And I mean everywhere. 
I could even see strands dangling from the ceiling. I found myself self-ducking away from the webs, not wanting any of it to touch me. I wasn't scared, just ew. Not paying attention, I almost ran into two dark figures carrying something big between them as they made their way across the room. While all of this is going down, my radar was still reporting nothing is there, and I was mentally screaming at it, what are you blind? As they walked past me, their features were too dark and blurry to make out any details except they wore what looked like short capes and tall hats. And snap, it all van vanished, disappeared. 1.19 a.m. Three minutes? It seemed longer than that. What just happened? So surprised, I never even snapped a picture. And when I played back the tape recording, it was just white noise. A bit unusual since I usually get go some ghost talk if the place is haunted. It didn't make any sense. First strange thing, I could not feel the ghost. It was like they weren't there. Second strange thing, they did not pay me any mind, as if they did not see me. So what's up? You have to want to do this, to want to help, because it takes many, many hours to research and research some more. Then I found it, Eureka. The home had been a part-time funeral home once upon a time. Part-time? And had been empty for several years before the family bought it. I'm sure they got a deal. There had to be a connection. Using what my abilities picked up, or in this case, did not pick up, I engaged other paranormal investigators who had cases with similar stories. Interviewing the children after learning what I did made sense now. The children and I watched a movie, the house recording an event of a funeral and the music from it, and was stuck in rerun mode. And the spider webs, the house recorded those too from when it had been empty. How? No idea. That's way above my pay wage. After explaining it to the parents, they moved the children out of the room and use it as storage now. Problem solved.